Greetings, my name is Cleo Alberta Lake Ai, and I'm going to read to you a poem that I've drafted that touches upon Bristol's history in connection to the transatlantic enslavement of African people, colonialism and climate change. A climate of change in this city. Names long upheld in colonial goof churn out of eat, sleep, repeat myth methodologies plunge from the cityscape. Rout, revolt, defeat, grey chronologies. Reckon on a better fate, but yet to hit industrial scale rethinking. With hands across the Atlantic, abolition. Sugar beet, not beaten bodies, sweet tea, tobacco and a cotton shirt commodities, capital from a cash crop in killing fields. From the River Severn to the Caribbean Sea, eels moved to mate, migrate, or did, or used to, or try to now, for now, as the past pollutes the present. Repent and repeat, repent and then please don't repeat deadly mistakes. Sankofa rebounds and convalesces, ancestral ambitions converge to remedy, lost chances and the death of sloths. Go slow, but keep moving. Go plant-based and consult with the wisdom of trees to feel constantly full on vitality. Medicine raises spirits and the generations coming already soar with eagles, waiting for their time. Over the course of its long history, the activities of Bristol's merchants and industrialists have had a fundamental impact on shaping the environment on a global scale. And much of this is tied up with the quest for power. And I think here, there's three principal kinds of power to be thought about. The first is social power, the kind of power and status in society that wealth brings you. The second, labour power, the power of workers to grow and construct things. And then the third is fuel, fossil power, the kind of energy today we get from petrol or diesel, or in the past potentially from coal. So I think the best place in the city to think about this social power today is Queen's Square. I think this really embodies the idea of trying to gain status by building impressive buildings, grand homes, a posh open square mimicking the finest residences in London. And I think this is equally notable in terms of thinking about the environment, because this area was formerly known as the Marsh, the era, area of boggy ground in the middle of the city, which had proved impossible to build on. And how was the wealth in order to build these grand homes and buildings gained? Well, a big part of that, particularly at that time in history, comes from the Atlantic economy and the use of slave labour in the American colonies, the Caribbean or Virginia. Here they took crops, exotic crops such as sugar and tobacco from one part of the world and occupied the ghost acres provided by these colonies left bare by the death of the native populations to gain great wealth through exploitation of enslaved labour and forced service. And this money didn't just go in to building grand houses. A lot of it was also invested into industry, seeking to further gain wealth by refining manufacturing methods. And this is where the quest for the, fourth, the third type of power comes in. When we look, for example, at Colebrookdale in Shropshire, which, where Abraham Darby developed the blast furnace, um, which was one of the key starting points of the Industrial Revolution. This used new refined types of coal to gain greater heat and more refined metal than ever before, opening up vast swathes of coal fields in the south of Wales, and more locally, the famous Kingsdown, Coll uh, Kingsdown Colliers. This is the beginnings of the injection of carbon into the environment, which ultimately have led to the climate crisis today. So this is something which is inherently tied up with Bristol and its history. So I'm thinking about power, the power we do have and that which we don't. 
Because I've lived in communities all my life where fossil fuels and factories were the backbone of the working class, but they're all gone and now you ask us what we think of power. I mean, don't get me wrong, we really do care about the planet, but if you don't want people to abandon it, you've got to give them better options. Got to stop the closing down of local shops and building up the flats that no one can afford, because that's not power. Because we're no less intelligent than anyone else, don't make that mistake, it's just that we've always got problems on our plate, like how to live and thrive in a society that drives us down. And that takes up a lot of space in our minds, so it's hard to find the time sometimes to think bigger. Not every single mum's gonna go vegan when she's gotta find some way, any way, to get her kids some dinner. And don't get me wrong, it's not that we don't care, it's just that our daily lives are filled with getting by, grin and bear it, keeping our heads above the waterline of our own lives so we don't always have the time to think about the rising water of a world that's drowning. And the solutions that lie around us aren't really made with us in mind. Health food shops and tiny houses, electric cars that cost us thousands, gentrification of the streets, living lives they treat as cheap. No disposable income, just fingers clicking disposable lighters, we've become buried in a whole generation of disposable items and... I wonder, if you asked us, if you really asked us, you'd find solution that our wisdom holds, passed down through family from days of old, cause we've made allotments and BMX tracks with collective spirit and muscled backs, we've made forest schools and community centres on council estates that get no attention. Even though you sold our land, even though you forced our hand, closed our factories, lost our jobs, gave us a world where we've been robbed, we want to make a better one with callous fingers, dirty thumbs. We the people, we can fix this, but you, you've lost our trust, so please give the power back to us. We are facing a climate crisis, the kind of which humanity has never seen before. How have we arrived in the 21st century at this point? We need to think in terms of our histories of imperialism and empire building, which was built upon the extraction and exploitation of peoples and their ecosystems. This accelerated during the Industrial Revolution, but did not begin then. I think it's a mindset around consumption around the exploitation of land, not as our space to conserve, the house in which we live, but as something from which, in a rapacious, unthinking way, we just extract and pull and pull from until there's nothing left. Let us think of the Roman Empire. Let's think of how the African lion was decimated in order to entertain the people of Rome and the Colosseums. Let us think about the encounters between the Portuguese and the Spanish with the people in the Americas. Let us think about the British Empire, this era of empire expansion. It wasn't just the bodies of African and American indigenous people that were used and exploited, but also the land and also the ecologies, feathers for hats turtle skins and turtle soup, woods that were precious and marveled at. And so this journey of extraction, this commodification of the land, this changing of relationship, leaves with us now a legacy of exploitation, a way of seeing the land that now has been exported across the globe. We have to reflect not just on our history here, but we are all involved in transforming and challenging the way we see our relationship with the earth, if we are to carry on existing.